I walk to the balcony and some kids have been drinking, you know, a party in the night and there's all this vomit on the sidewalk down below. I'm up on the second floor and I say, good, go to your parties, get drunk, go home for the weekend with all your friends. You're probably smarter than me, but it doesn't matter because when you're goofing off, I'll be studying. I'm going to catch you guys. I was determined that if I don't make it in school, it's not going to be because I didn't try hard enough. It'll be because I just couldn't do it. Hello, everybody. We are back today with Dr. Peter Rogers. He is a Stanford and Harvard educated MD and neuroradiologist who for over 30 years has helped people optimize their performance. Today, we're going to learn from Dr. Rogers how to stay motivated to be our smartest, best, healthiest selves. It feels like in today's society, we're often disincentivized from doing that. And Dr. Rogers inspires me a lot with his drive and his passion. So first, Dr. Rogers, what motivates you to be the best? I think a couple things is that I spent a long time thinking, what do I want to do with my life? What do I want to do with my time? And the reason I say that is once you're committed to something, and it's both your conscious mind and your unconscious mind, if you will, they are working together, then you can go straight to it. And there's no distractions. And by that, I mean, a lot of people, they've got second thoughts and lingering doubts. And it's hard for them to focus their energy because it's like, well, do I really want to do this? You know, it's kind of like hard to get motivated for school if you're in grade school or, or high school or something and you think it's a waste of time. So what I'm getting at by that is I've made up my mind. This is how much time I've got left in my life. This is what I want to do. And so because I, I, I'm at peace with that, I have a tremendous energy. Like I've decided, you know, look, there's lots of things I'd love to do, but I just can't do them anymore. I'd love to wrestle still and coach wrestling, but I got a little bit of a shoulder injury. I don't live near a place where I could coach. You just have to give things up. And that's that's part of getting older. But on the other hand, I said, academically, I love reading all this medical nutrition literature and I've got a, a really good background for it and I have a natural talent for it. So I enjoy it. So I'm going to do it. I don't make any money with this stuff, but it's such a great thing. Plus also you have to remember, Every day I see a bunch of people, people dying from terrible complications and it's all preventable diseases. So I say, I'll at least give it a try making these videos. Plus I go through all the medical books and they're all wrong. They all, they stink. Okay. And the reason they stink is because first of all, there's no money in nutrition and pathophysiology. Like I just mentioned the autoimmune chapter and the major Harvard textbook of autoimmune of disease. They don't even mention leaky gut. It's the most important thing. And it's like that for all the common diseases, coronary artery disease. There's no mention of uh, hemorrheology. They don't even know that atherosclerosis is a blood clot. So what I'm saying is I have tremendous motivation to do this because there's very few people on the internet speaking about these diseases at a, what I would consider an advanced level. And also there's a lot of people on the internet that are BSing people. Um, they're, they're just trying to sell supplements and stuff, or it's almost like I see two categories of, uh, of vegans, if you will. There's the low fat vegans, which I think is what the true literature supports. And then there's the high fat vegans, which I think are really trying to get people to eat plants, but they still want them eating lots of fat, which is going to make them sick. Anyways, okay, but I got off. You asked me, like, what makes me strong and committed? Well, maybe I'll tell you a story going back I, going back to my, my, high, my college years, because that kind of is, is where this all comes from. When I was in high school, I was like the happiest person in the world, okay? I loved being a wrestler. I had a wonderful family. I was happy. I had nice friends. And I had a nice girlfriend most of the time. Everything was as good as it could get. Like I said, if I could do it all over again, I would flunk senior year of high school three times in a row. So then I got injured. And all of a sudden, I went from being the best guy in the state to not even being able to participate on the team. And I was like, holy crap. My whole identity like disappeared. I figured, well, I'll come back. I kept trying to come back too soon and getting re-injured. I fractured a growth plate in my clavicle, and I kept refracturing it. And I was really sad about that. My senior year of high school, I wanted to run away from home because I couldn't wrestle in a state tournament. And my dad wouldn't let me. He's like, school's more important than wrestling. You're not taking a year off. And I was pissed off at my father. I wanted to run away from home. So it was a major psychological, dramatic thing, drama for me. And then Stanford still offered me a scholarship. The Big Ten schools, they wanted me to come, but they wouldn't give me a scholarship anymore. So I'm like, well, you know, screw it. And I was also embarrassed. My friends would all say to me, hey, Raj, what happened to you? Because I used to be a pretty muscular guy. And all of a sudden, I lost all his weight. So I go, you know what, I'm going to go to Stanford and I'm going to reinvent myself. I'm going to come back, you know, and, you know, hopefully successful wrestler. And um, so I went to Stanford and I really liked the coaches out there, the Schultz brothers, for example, and a lot of the wrestlers were really nice and it was beautiful out in California and all that. But it took me a little while. I got re-injured again at the beginning of my freshman year. Of, I'm kind of telling you this because I sort of was hitting my rock bottom, if you will, in my life. I got re-injured again. Some of the guys told me on the team, the coach was pissed off. He wasted a scholarship on me. I'm missing my girlfriend. 
uh, missing my family. I don't know a single kid. And I'm kind of shy by my natural personality, especially at that age. So I don't know anybody. I'm just alone in my dorm all the time. And I'm scared. I'm very scared because in high school, I wasn't that serious of a student. Both of my, pa my parents are off the boat foreigners. So they didn't know anything about America. I never took an honors class in, in high school. I didn't even know what an AP class was. And here I am at Stanford where all these kids have like finished the first year of college already. And so I'm scared I'm going to flunk out. I'm scared the coach is going to kick me off the team for wasting a scholarship. And then I'm worried my girlfriend even too. She said, oh, would it be okay for her to go to homecoming with this other guy? She promised not to do anything sexual with him. And I'm like, God, does my life suck or what? You know, <laughs> I got no friends. I don't know anybody. My athletic career is in the garbage can and I'm afraid I'm going to flunk out. So anyways, I called my mom. I said, you know what, mom? I just don't like it out here. I'm too lonely. I want to come back to Illinois. It's from Chicago area. And she's like, Peter, I want you to try for just one year. Try as hard as you can. She said, God doesn't want you to be a wrestler. He wants you to be a scholar. He wants you to be a scientist or a doctor. I think you're going to be a great scientist or doctor. And I'm like, you know what, mom? I'll go with that. I think you might be right. I'll go with that. Okay. And that gave me tremendous inner peace. I'm like, I'm going to put all my energy into that. That way, even if I can't wrestle for a certain amount of time because I was injured again, I'll at least work hard in that way. And I, I knew my personality. I wasn't that confident if I'd be smart enough, but I knew I could push myself. And I said, I will study till I drop out of this chair. Um, and I also, I walked to the balcony and some kids have been drinking, you know, a party in the night, you know, that's, and there's all this vomit on the sidewalk down below. I'm up on the second floor. And I said, good, go to your parties, get drunk, go home for the weekend with all your friends. You're probably smarter than me, but it doesn't matter. Because when you're goofing off, I'll be studying. I'm going to catch you guys. And I, I was determined that if I if I don't make it in school, it's going to be because I didn't. It's not going to be because I didn't try hard enough. It'll be because I just couldn't do it. And so I was incredibly motivated. And it reminded me of two psychological principles. The first one is the Alfred Adler inferiority principle, where a person is sad and feels inferior in some way because of something they failed at in their life, which for me was wrestling. And then they take that frustration and energy and they put it into something else positive. So. That's what I did. And that's also called sublimation, of course. And it also relates to what's called the Dabronsky theory of personality disintegration and reintegration, which is very similar to this, very popular in the gifted community of you have a sadness, a disappointment, and you're very frustrated, even angry, upset. Um, and you just take that energy and you put it into something else. And, and luckily, I found something else to put it into. So that got me to study like crazy. And then I also, the next thing you want to do is whenever you have a goal, find somebody else who's good at that. And study them. You know, if you can talk to them in person, that's great. If you can watch their videos, that's great. Or if you can meet them, that's even better and talk to them, hang around with them, you know, volunteer to just shadow them and go around with them. Because I found a guy who was getting A pluses in school. And I'm like, hey, can I study with you? Show me your thing. Because like, I'm scared. I, I got all B's, B minus my first uh, quarter of grades. And, uh, and I wasn't even taking any hard classes yet. So I just hung around with this guy and I saw how he studied. He would make what I would call condensed notes. And by having all his notes organized in one spot, it was very easy for him to review for midterms and final exams. And I started doing what he did, and I, my grades started dramatically improving. Um, and I also saw his personality. What I mean by that is he didn't just memorize a bunch of stuff and take a test. He was interested in it. And so we took a class together, and we'd have a conversation about it. You know, like when we took biology together in the second year, we didn't just memorize stuff for a test. We went out to the woods. We went bird watching. He had an older friend who was a naturalist. And we started, you know, talking about all the environments and stuff. I got so excited about biology, just like that. I went to the Palo Alto Baylands bird watching. And I really enjoyed it out there. But I'm like, well, gee. So I go up to the administrative desk over there. They have a little resource nature center. I go, where's your field guide? They go, we don't have a field guide. I'm like, well, you need a field guide. And so I just made one. Okay. You know, <laughs> I don't really have a lot of free time. But I said, you know what? This place needs a field guide. So I, I, I studied all the birds out there, all the environmental stuff, and, and wrote a field guide book about it. And so what I, what I mean by that is that's where my personality was at. I was like, if I can't be a great athlete, I'm going to become a great scientist or doctor. I don't even know what I'm going to do, but I'm going to do something. I was sort of like I wanted to redeem myself. I felt like a failure. I felt sad. And I was kind of hard on myself. I was like, mad at me. It's your fault, you stupid idiot, because you kept coming back too soon. You ruined your own life. Your life's always going to suck from now on. You know, what else could you do? I'm like, well, you know what? I like this biology science stuff. I'm going to do this. And it, it made me happy to have something to do um, and to kind of forget about being lonely and far from home. And so anyways, that's, I think, where my energy came from there. And like I said, it was a little bit of the burn the boats mentality. If, you know, like when Cortez went to Mexico and all the soldiers were like, screw this Mexico place. We don't want to be here. We want to go back home. And he says, nope, we burn the boats out in the ocean. Like, you're going to have to survive here in Mexico. That's it. Take it or leave it. And, and what I mean by that is you almost have to, I think, sometimes do that is put yourself in a situation where it's sink or swim. And even though you don't like that, <laughs> um, 
it, it, it's it's very energizing. If you could have done things over again, would you have paced yourself more when it came to coming back from your injuries? I screwed up. I came back too soon and I got re-injured and I really should have taken off senior year of high school and come back and just won the state championship. That would have been so much better. At my age and back in those days, you did what your parents said, you know? I was mad at my father, but I obeyed my father. And, you know, I've now that I'm older, I tend to be much more skeptical, less accepting of authority, because I know most of the time it's BS, whatever they say. But at that time, you know, he was my dad. I love my father and he was the boss. And so I'm like, OK, uh, but retrospectively, I wish I had registered and went back and won state tournaments, um, et cetera. So anyways, that may be it is what it is. You know, you can't. Yeah. In general, do you think that young people, because they think they're bulletproof until they finally <laughs> hit a wall in terms of athleticism or performance, do you think that young people rush things too much, take things too fast at detriment to their own health? Well, I think what most people do is there's a lady by the name of Ayn Rand. I actually think she's the smartest woman who ever lived. She wrote an essay called Comprachicos. You know, like what, what it was about was she felt that putting children into preschool together and grade school together, all of the same age was very bad for their development. And I think she's correct about that. Let me explain. What I saw like happened to my own kids. You know, my wife and I had a disagreement about how to raise the kids. She wanted to give them a cell phone so that if they go to the friend's house, they can call when she need a ride. She can keep track of them more easily, call them whenever she wants. They can call her whenever they want. And I'm like, you know, when I was growing up, I never had a cell phone. You don't have to have a cell phone. And what I mean by that is it was like the children's IQs dropped about 20, 30 points as soon as they got their cell phone. They never wanted to read a book anymore. They never wanted to talk to me about books anymore. They just want to text their friends all day long, go to the friend's house, and they become interested in a little bit of social media. And what I'm saying is it turns people into idiots. All this, you know, attention deficit, quick fix, um, high yield social stuff that I think to be intellectually a sophisticated person, you have to spend some time alone. You have to spend time thinking about ideas, reading or studying something, pondering something and be reflective, sensitive, thoughtful. And, you know, instead you got these kids are sleeping with their cell phone next to the phone. And I go in the room and go, your phone should not be near your head. You know, move that phone or I'm going to take your way of your phone. No, no, not that. Anything but that. You know, and so I think it stupefies people. When children are all the same age, they want to be like each other and they develop a click and all of them are the same age. So none of them really knows much different than the other. On the other hand, if you spend some time with an older person who has some experience, let's say in an area that you're interested in, you're going to learn a lot from them. They've got, you know, years, decades of experience that can benefit you and your progress can be really fast. Like, so what you want, what am I saying? What I'm saying is if you're young, try to find good mentors, try to find good coaches. That's the fastest way to rapidly progress. Um, I'll, I'll tell you one more story along those lines. My sophomore year of wrestling, you know, it was kind of similar. I mean, I had a decent record. I made varsity starter and I had a winning record, but I still, you know, when I was in high school, I used to, you know, pinning almost all my opponents. Okay. And all of a sudden I'm just happy to be above 500 and I'm, a, I'm injured again, but then I'm doing okay. And anyways, my, I thought about even quitting wrestling because, you know, the coach was still a little pissed off. He felt he wasn't getting as much out of me as he should. And I talked to one of the Schultz brothers. I told you, Mark and Dave Schultz, they were from Palo Alto. They were the famous ones who were in the Fox Catcher movie. They're both world and Olympic champions. And Schultz walks out to me. And, you know, the other, we had another head coach named Horpel who kind of dominated things. And Schultz goes out to me, he goes, Rogers, what is wrong with you? He goes, I heard you're thinking about quitting. He goes, you're not quitting. He goes, you got talent. You hang around with me for a couple of months. And he stopped hanging around with all these studious nerd kids. You got to hang out with the wrestlers. You live in an athlete fraternity. You train with me the next couple of months. You're going to be fine. I go, okay. <laughs> he was a big, scary guy. He was like the scariest guy in the whole United States. I'm like, yes, sir. Okay. So anyways, I did. I hung around the next couple of months and he told me all these stories. He told me all these stories about the wrestlers, you know, about Gene Mills. He goes, we went to Russia and we had to wrestle the Russians. The Russians are world champions. Gene Mills is a little 118 pounder guy. And he's like, we were all scared of the Russians. Gene Mills says, I'm going to kick the SHIT out of this Russian. And he did. And, and anyways, what I'm trying to say is if you're around a bunch of people, they're worried about their next match and hope they win your confidence levels like here. But if you're around a guy who's a world and Olympic champion and he just beats everybody in the world, including all the Russians who were the best in the world at that time, it gives you confidence. And my confidence started increasing. I started getting his whole psychology. He was in a very bizarre psychology, but it's awesome. He would do things like before a match, he wouldn't speak to anybody for a week. And I realize that sounds a little crazy, but he would have all this pent up energy that when he would go out there, he had this off the charts energy. So I learned that from him. And his brother, Dave Schultz, is really interesting. If you look these guys up, you see World Olympic champions, Mark Schultz and Dave Schultz. They're both from Palo Alto. Dave Schultz, when he was a kid, he was sort of fat, dyslexic, 
and the other kids bullied him, you know, fat so and stuff and picked on him. He joined the wrestling team and they also called him stupid, you know, dyslexic kid wasn't getting good grades in school. And he just started doing wrestling and he liked it. He had a knack for it. By the time he was in junior high, he had his big exercise bag of workout gears, you know, his wrestling clothes and stuff. He would go to junior high practice, ride his bicycle to the Palo Alto High, Pali High. Then he'd ride his bicycle over to Stanford to train with those guys. He became the best high school wrestler in the entire United States, probably in the history of the United States. By the time he was senior in high school, he won the national open tournament. He pinned Chuck Yagler from Iowa in the finals. So what am I saying is it's that type of intensity that creates great achievement. He said, I'm going to be a wrestler. And all he did was train all the time. And he, he found older mentors. That's how you get great. Um, so the secret is, once I started hanging around the Schultz's, I got really good. I, next year, I came back. I set the school record for wins in a season. I was team captain. I won the Stanford Student Athlete of the Year Award. So that really turned things around for me. You know, Schultz really kind of saved me. I went from being ready to quit, maybe even drop out of school. I was kind of still kind of lonely and injured and stuff to now I was real happy and things are better. Plus, I hung around the wrestlers. So you can relate to each other as the wrestlers. You know, you got to make weight on Friday. You got to do this or that. Go to this tournament. I wrestled also all in the off season. Um, in the past, I would sometimes have distractions. I couldn't compete in the off season. If you want to be really good at something, you probably should figure out a way to be in competition all year round. Competition increases your energy to perform. So if you are, if you're a pianist, go to piano competitions. Um, it just energizes you when you're in some form of competition. Makes perfect sense. And my friend, Andy Baines, the nutritionist was wondering, how does one prevent physical and mental burnout? Someone like you, you know, studying 12 hours a day, is such amazing capacity to work. Have you ever experienced burnout? And yeah, yeah, yeah. You get sometimes get a little burnt out. So you got to try to make sure you're getting your sleep, but you have to also psychologically commit to what you want to do. If you try to find something that you really want to do. Um, and I'll, I'll give you an example, for example, biochemistry. All right. Uh, what I said to myself is biochemistry is the language of God. That's how he writes the book of life. And I need to learn this and I want to learn it and stuff. And because I kind of viewed it that way, that gave me a lot of energy to study it. Whereas you'll hear a lot of students say biochemistry sucks. It's a pain in the ass. It's so difficult. Why do I have to learn this? Am I really going to need biochemistry to be a doctor or to be a scientist or whatever? And what I'm trying to say is if you are in an, that sort of grateful, appreciative mode, I'm lucky to have an opportunity to study this you will study a lot better. And my father said something to me like when I was a freshman, he's like, when you quit your bitching, he says, you know, ever since the beginning of recorded history, the young men have to go out and fight in the war. You know, they could send your, your butt to the front line. You could be getting, you know, shot at or people throwing stuff at you. You're pretty damn lucky. You get to sit around working in a school. He goes, since the beginning of time, most people have been peasants just trying to scratch a little food out of the ground, you know, quit your wine and do your work, you know? And so my father was a little harsh, but he had a point, you know? And I think that was good for me too. So I was considering myself, I am grateful to have the opportunity to get an education. And um, those were some of the things that were helpful, but I knew I wanted to do it. I think that's really mattered the most because because we had a, I had a guy one time I lived with as a second year. I lived with these scholarly guys and one of the guys, a really good student. And this one guy was really bright guy. He's like from the East Coast had gone to the, all the East Coast prep schools, all that stuff. Um, and he started, you know, smoking marijuana MJ and he couldn't get motivated. He wasn't doing well in school, even though he was a super bright guy because he didn't have himself figured out what he wanted to do. Um, and in a sense, knowing what you want to do, I mean, you can't be certain of what you're going to do 20 years from now, but you can at least say, I'm either going to be a physician or I'm going to be a scientist or I'm going to be a veterinarian. I kind of had this idea. I'll be a wildlife veterinarian, sort of like my father was a psychiatrist and I'm like, well, I'm going to do something better than my dad. You know, my dad thinks he's hot shit. I'm going to do something better than him. I'll be a wildlife veterinarian because that's even more sophisticated and cool and kind of neat and let him be jealous. That's what I'm going to do. And because I had a lot of a rivalry with my father because my father would say stuff to me. He's a little bit mean. He's pissed me off. You know, I was used to winning tournaments in high school, you know, and then in, in college, I would maybe, you know, let's say I took third or fourth in a tournament and my dad would be like, well, why didn't you win? And I'm like, well, why didn't you let me redshirt? Why didn't you let me take an extra year off from high school? You know, so I think actually kids benefit from their mother and father. Mothers tend to be more unconditional love. Oh, I love you. You're so wonderful. Whereas fathers tend to be, get your lazy ass in gear. Come on, what is wrong with you? So you maybe need a little bit of both, even though the father could be quite annoying when he's like that. Oh yeah, I, I definitely agree with you. We need both the balance, the yin and the yang. And you talked about how there's some people who just no motivation, no purpose. In today's society, there are so many people who are just very depressed, very anxious, and they don't know their life purpose or have feel like they haven't found it they spend years working jobs they hate and they're just so unmotivated do you have advice on how people can find their life purpose 
Right. I, I think what makes you happy, first of all, you have to, uh, and kind of getting back to that stuff, what I said, it's, it's bad to be around a bunch of people your own age all the time because you become stupid. And that was the point of Ayn Rand's book is that young people should spend time with older people who are knowledgeable in things that they enjoy or care about. And you'll, you'll learn from that and discover things. So what I'm saying is we like things where we help other people because I think it's because we get release of uh, reward neurotransmitters in our brain once we help other people because it improves our relationships with them and humans survive better in social groups. So I think we're just programmed for that to make us happy. All right. So then you have to figure out what is it that I like? So just spend some time by yourself. What is it that I like? Even write it down. What do I like? What do I not like? How can I just get more time doing what I like? How can I make some money doing what I like? Because eventually I'll have to pay some bills. And what are my talents? You know, we all have a gift for certain things. Like it would be fun to be a singer, but you know, I can't sing. So I can't be a singer. You just have to accept you don't have some skills. And then, then you start to figure that out. In addition to, I think a lot of people have emotional problems because of all their, their they have a terrible diet. You know, they, they, they don't sleep enough. They drink a lot of caffeine. I've seen a lot of young people that they stay up late at night routinely. And so that can throw off your brain function a little, you know, and they're eating really high salt, high fat meals, all of that diminishes cognitive function. The processed foods got a lot of monosodium glutamate. It's an excitotoxin. Uh, it mimics a neurotransmitter glutamate. It's about 70, 80% of the brain neurotransmitters. So all these things knock down their, their cognitive function. Also, they shouldn't be holding their cell phones to their brain. Even though I haven't seen a significant incidence of brain tumors, I have seen over the years, a major increase in cognitive impairment. So I think a lot of people are cognitively impaired and they've got these short attention spans where they're not able to sort of process. Um, I see also when I speak to young men, a lot of them are sort of impulsive. They they want an answer in two seconds. They don't want to have a sophisticated conversation. They always go, it's obvious, it's obvious. I actually joke. I, I lifted weights sometimes with some young guys and they swear almost every other sentence. It's the F word, this effing thing, this effing thing. What's this effing thing, this effing thing. I'm like, you guys, I realize you're lifting weights. You want to be macho and tough, but I'm saying you want to learn, Aristotle said, the first step to an intelligent conversation is to remove all emotions. I like the idea of this, you know, the five blind mind or six blind men and the elephant. You've seen that, that picture is that basically, you know, the first guy says, holds the tail, it's a rope. The next guy holds the ear, says it's a rug. Another guy holds the leg, says, oh, it's a tree. The point being is don't commit to any conclusions. Don't get emotional about anything. Just try to get all the information and then obtain like a bird's eye view, if you will, and look down and go, it's an elephant. And what I'm saying is, Lots of people, because they're so impulsive and in such a hurry, they can never put it all together. And that makes them incapable of sophisticated thinking. Um, and, you know, you in this life, you have to figure out what's real so you can act based on reality. If, you, if you're not able to perceive and understand what's real, you're going to make a lot of stupid decisions. Um, so th these are valuable things, what I would call these thinking skills. Well, I'll give you a good quote, too. Um, this one is from Ayn Rand. She says, if you think there's a contradiction, then recheck your premises. There are no contradictions. That's very valuable. Because there'll be times when I'm like, why isn't this the way I think it is? How come I'm not getting this? And then I would see, well, I just made some assumption. And once I rechecked my assumptions, my premises, I was able to figure the situation out. I've had a lot of, especially for me, social situations. I was less smart socially than I was in school. And um those types of things can help. Another thing is, here's a great one too. This one comes from uh, Carlyle. He's the English philosopher. He says, there's always a good reason for something. And then there's the real reason. Quite often people are BSing you and lying to you all the time. And they'll give you a reason for something. And on the surface of it, that seems nice and pleasant and reasonable, but something doesn't feel right. Quite often when you get that feeling, it doesn't feel right. They're lying to you. And then the real reason is they're trying to trick you into doing something. They're trying to trick you to buying something or trying to trick you into accepting some idea or some other. And so having these little thinking tools, rules of thumb, if you will, they help you to think your way through complex situations. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. On the subject of Ayn Rand, I actually read Atlas Shrugged when I was in sixth grade because my friend who was an English literature major had recommended it to me. And I remember I had the book, I was sitting in middle school, re just reading it. And my teacher saw it and said, why do you have that book on you? Stop reading it. And that was when I knew that some people just don't want to open their eyes to information for some reason. I just so admire how you just say the truth. You put it out there and you encourage people to think for themselves. That's such a valuable skill that we increasingly lose in today's impulsive society where everyone just takes stuff at face value. Yeah, I think basically the public school system is designed to turn people into minimum wage conformists. 
And so it makes them real simple minded because it makes them easier to control. You know, in a sense, the way they're perceived by the big corporations is as basically cattle. Okay. And they want predictable cattle that can do what it's told, doesn't talk back, uh, not very articulate. And so all these things we're talking about, like a liberal arts education in the time of Rome and Greece, especially Rome now, that meant education for a free man. Okay, vocational education, which is emphasized throughout our high school and university system, that is the education for training somebody to be a low minimum wage worker. Okay, if you're going to be more sophisticated, you have to develop the ability to think. And that's not the same. Almost everything in school, grade school, high school, and most of college is basically just memorization, you know, and that is not the way knowledge has been used historically. And that's not how knowledge is used in the real world. You know, I joke, let's say somebody brings a brain MRI to me and says, what do you think this patient has? Am I going to tell them, can you just give me a Scantron test? No, I got to look at the films, articulate the findings, then put together a differential diagnosis and make a conclusion. Okay. And so that's what real life is like. Um, and the other thing I've seen over the years is that people who read a lot and they're articulate, if somebody messes with them, they can speak up for themselves and fight back. OK, versus most people, they don't ever read another book. They go to freshman year of high school and they have to read these miserable books like, you know, Great Expectorations, the worst Charles Dickens book ever written, Julius Caesar. OK, which no one's ready for that at freshman year of high school. And then they get in their mind. They just sort of sense that reading is a waste of time and they never read another book again the rest of their life. And so then if they ever, you know, what you can tell somebody's intellect quite often is have them write a letter, just a brief letter. Most people can't write a brief letter. I also know it because I sometimes have to talk to people on the phone and they'll have to read something to me. And I know what they're reading to me and I can tell by how they read it, you know, their ability to process information. And what I'm trying to say is I have seen people get picked on who can't articulate well and they can't fight back. They're kind of helpless. And what I'm saying is the corporate public education turns people into minimum wage conformists who are sort of like helpless minimum wage workers. They have, they have no ability to write well, to speak well, to articulate their feelings, their deep down inner sentiments. And because of that, they get pushed around, they end up taking lousy pay and accepting bad conditions. And that's their whole life. Uh, so you don't want that to happen to you. And Ayn Rand, even though, yeah, people say, oh, she's a selfish B-I-T-C-H. I've read her rather closely, a whole bunch of her books. She did a lot of good things. Atlas Shrugged was a tremendous, one of the greatest books ever written for a celebration of freedom. She basically said, if somebody does work, they deserve to get paid for it versus the idea of, oh, no, we all have to, you know, pay more taxes and give up everything we ever worked for. And everybody is the same. No, everybody should, you know, be in a meritocracy. You get credit for whatever you do. OK, and you should be allowed to own private property. If you take away private property, people lose their incentive and you just end up in mediocrity. Agreed 100 percent that the fountainhead, all her works are revolutionary and I think there's good reason that there are those who wish for those works to be suppressed. I'm so glad we can chat about them out in the open, which is what my sixth grade teacher did not want of me. And I'm wondering, you came from the culture of wrestling where everyone had this attitude of being the best and you're around the best people. You came from that to where you are now, which is that you're working in the medical system, everyone around you, most of them are just robots following what they're told, yet you still have that spirit of, I'm going to keep saying the truth and bashing my head against this industry. Are there people in real life who are inspirations to you, kind of the way that the Schultz brothers were? Well, for example, Dr. McDougal has been an inspiration for me in the health and the medical world because... Like I said, my last Chef AJ lecture, I was a little pissed off because I was basically as good as a medical student could be. Perfect scores on my boards in medical school and residency, fellowship at Harvard, imaging guided surgery. You know, what more could I do? And here I am in my early to mid 30s. I'm fat. My mom's dying of cancer and my father's having heart disease problems. And I'm like, if I'm such a great doctor, I've memorized the books. I'm like a vacuum going through the book. OK, I memorized the books cover to cover. I guess medicine can't do anything or I'm missing something. And I'm like, well, what am I missing? And then what was a transformational moment with me as far as that's concerned was I was talking to my sister-in-law and she's kind of a, a vegetarian and she's on the phone with me and she's trying to give me advice about food. And I was kind of thinking, I, you know, I had like the, about the best board scores in the whole United States on biochemistry and it was called nutrition too. So I'm, I'm kind of arrogant listening to her telling me to eat a plant-based diet. I thought that was all BS at that time. You know, I used to think of that as like, you know, a hippie from the 1960s, smoking MJ, wearing a Grateful Dead t-shirt, this vegetarian crap. Don't tell me that. I'm a wrestler. You know, this vegetarian stuff's a bunch of nonsense. That's what I, that's where my thought was at at that time. This is many years ago. 
And she goes, well, Mr. Doctor, if you know so much about nutrition, why are you so fat? And I'm like, wow, she's right. You know, because I had been fat for a couple of years at that point. Uh, I was overworked the year that it happened. I kept thinking I'd lose it and I couldn't lose it for a couple of years. And I started getting scared. I'm going to end up a big fat diabetic, probably with heart disease. I'll probably be impotent. You know, and my wife teased me. She goes, I don't care if you get impotent. That'll make my life easier. And I'm like, oh, you know what? This is great. This I'm not going to let this happen. No way. I said, I'm going to devote myself to understanding this. And then I started just read nonstop through nutrition. And I kept making more and more rapid progress. And then I ran into a little of a, a plateau. Dr. McDougall's idea of you have to eat starch, that really helped me. And then I sort of ate more starch and um, I uh, then started to progress real well. And I just kept finding myself fascinated. There was always more stuff to learn. And it was interesting and it was immediately applicable, you know? Okay, then tomorrow I'll eat this. And I also noticed that my friends, like at work and stuff, um, they all wanted to talk about it because they're all worried, especially the older people, you know, they're scared they're going to get a disease and stuff. And they see real sick people every day. So it's for real to them. I've also noticed doctors who take care of inpatients, sick people, they're more scared than doctors who work in outpatient areas because a lot of their patients are tend to be walker talkers, you know, versus you see a lot of these people on a ventilator with five tubes coming out of them. You're like, I don't want to end up like that. Um, so anyways, that motivated me. So my free time, um, I just read a tremendous amount, kept learning new things, found it real interesting and enjoyable and went from there. Yeah. So has it always been within your personality to feel comfortable being different from everybody else? Oh yeah. Cause that, that's actually one thing that kind of, I found, I'll explain like in wrestling, we loved it when the new wrestler would come along and they had innovative technique, you know, some guy, uh, Jesse Reyes from Bakersfield has inside trip. We're like, cool. That's cool. How does he do it? How does he set it up? What's the key thing? What makes it work? You know, we all wanted to study his technique. We all wanted to imitate him. Medicine's not like that. Medicine is basically, here's how it works. There's a certain amount of money being made with the current system. Okay. And there's persons at the top who are getting the most money out of the current system, like big pharma, for example, they don't want anything to change medicine. They act like it's written in stone. And quite frankly, it's stupid. The wrestling was smart. We all talked about new technique. We'd see something, some guy would bring something new and we'd all learn it. We all wanted to do it. We all wanted to understand it. We all wanted to get better because if you get better, you're more likely to win. Nobody likes losing. It can be painful too when you lose in wrestling. So what I'm saying is we were 100% merit, meritocracy, okay? And we all talk together, work together to improve. Versus in medicine, what I find is if you just match the ill to the pill and send a bill, you get your work done fast, you make your money and you go home. Okay, the only problem is the patients have crappy outcomes. So when I started learning all this stuff, oh my gosh, all the textbooks are wrong. There's information, you know, from this epidemiology study that you can prevent coronary artery disease in this way. You can prevent hypertension in this way. You can cure type two diabetes. You can cure autoimmune disease quite often. I was all excited and happy. I figure I'm going to, you know, save all these patients. I'm going to make a ton of money. Everybody's going to love me. No, -uh -uh. most of the patients, they don't want to change their diet. Most of the doctors had, a few of them were real interested, but a lot of them are not interested. And the higher up you go in the food chain, the less likely they're interested in it because they're making a ton of money. Here's how it works. Let's say a patient comes in with heart disease. Let's say a fat guy walks in your office, a 55-year-old fat man. He's going to be pre-diabetic or diabetic. So you can put him on meds for that. He's going to have hypertension. You can put him on at least one or two meds for that, maybe three. He's going to have high cholesterol. There's a pill, high triglycerides. Here's something else. You can really quick get that guy on five to seven medicines. Got to get more lab tests. He has to come back, you know, maybe in three weeks initially, then in three months. For the rest of his life, he has to take those pills every single day. So he's basically, it's like milking a cow. You're getting money off that guy every day the rest of his life. And then it's even worse. Let's say he has active chest pain. He has to go for a cardiac workup. Maybe they'll put a stent in at $20,000 of billing. Maybe he's going to go for open heart surgery. They'll bill for that like about $100,000. So imagine you run a hospital. Do you want this guy going on a low-fat vegan Esselstyn diet, curing himself? Or do you want $100,000 from open heart surgery and a bunch of money for meds and all this other stuff? So I hate to say it, but the incentive, if you look at the money with medicine, it's always towards more surgery and more pills. And so that's why I'm actually, I don't push my ideas too much unless people are really interested. Like I, if I'm talking to somebody who's interested, I, at first, like my internal medicine friends, they'll come up to me and they'll, they'll, they want me to help them with their own problems, even in their own field. They know that I know their own field better than them in a lot of areas. Okay. And I always am happy to help them. But I, many years ago, I would ask, why don't you have me give your grand rounds? You know, I'm, I know the subject. I'd be happy to talk to you guys. And he goes, well, let me get back to you. I'll get back to you. They never do. And I know it's because they're scared. They're scared that first of all, they're embarrassed because I know their own field a lot better than them. Secondly, they're embarrassed because they don't want this information coming out. 
because then they would have to do all this extra work. They wouldn't get paid for it. Think of you're an internal medicine doctor and you got to see 25, 30 patients in a day. If you're sitting there talking to them about nutrition, epidemiology, it's going to take too long. You're going to start only being able to see 15 patients a day. Then there's always going to be somebody who runs the clinic, a bean counter, and the bean counter is going to say, how come the other doctors are seeing 30 patients a day and you're only seeing 15? You're not pulling your weight. You're not bringing in enough revenue to this clinic. If this continues, we're going to have to, you know, fire you from this job. Okay. We need the money coming into the clinic. That's how we pay our bills. So that's why, you know, the poor patient goes in thinking, oh, my doctor is an expert. I hope they cure me. But the doctor, they have to make the bean counter happy. They have to make the insurance co company happy. Then there's also a standard of care. Almost all the standard of care is written at the sort of IV or other famous medical centers. And it's usually written by the doctors at those places all want to get grant money for research. That grant money typically comes from big pharma. So they have to please big pharma. So they might get asked to read the, read, write the guidelines for hypertension. Well, guess what? Those guidelines had better make big pharma happy or that doctor will never get any research money. So the guidelines are written based on pleasing big pharma. Can you imagine if one of them says, I want you know, to try the, the Kempner diet for treating hypertension? They'll say, fire that guy. You know what I'm saying? So that guy will not be able to keep his job at the big name institution. And that's why if you ever notice all these nutrition experts, they always are working in some small place, podunk place that's not heard of in the nutrition system or have their own practice because in a big university system, you simply cannot practice that way. You will not make money. You'll sooner or later get fired from your job. And quite frankly, what happens to the patient is considered irrelevant. By that, I mean, in almost all medical centers, no one follows patient outcomes. What everyone says is, look, all of our doctors are board certified. All of them are practicing the standard of care. Of course, that's the best anyone can do is a standard of care. Therefore, you know, they what they do is they, they tend to think in what I would describe as an industrial way. Like if you go to some university medical center, they'll say, last year we performed, you know, 100 surgeries for pancreatic carcinoma. We're the most experienced center. They don't tell you what were their outcomes, okay? Compare that to a vegan diet. The vegan diet would probably be a lot better, but no one's ever going to say that. Yeah, I made some notes to myself, things to remember to say. Mm -hmm. um, I really like Brian Tracy's book. There's a guy by the name of Brian Tracy, and he wrote a book called Maximum Achievement. And a lot of that is sort of that psychology of getting your conscious mind and your subconscious mind in alignment. Your subconscious mind has to be aligned because if you are committed in every sense of the word, you will just go and do the activity. You're not going to be too distracted. You'll be saying to yourself, what could be more important than this activity? Of course, I'm going to focus on that. I also think religion helps a person. The public schools kind of push religion away from people. But if you look at the history of creativity, tremendous amount of the best creative work ever in the history of the world has come from people that are very religious. And it can generate a sense of, I don't know, intense energy for the task. Look at Bach. I think he's the best composer of all time. He wrote on every composition to the greater glory of God, okay? It energized the guy. Look at, um, let's say, Michelangelo. He says, everything I do... I do it out of love and uh, you know honor for God, okay? To praise God with the creation. So what I'm trying to say is religion is frowned on in the public schools and all that because if you want to create a bunch of conformist minimum wage workers, you don't want them to think that there's, to ever think there's two ways of looking at something. You want them to always just accept the authority. This is what you are told. Just shut up and do as you're told. On the other hand, if somebody says, well, from a Christian point of view, the other thing too is it helps, I think, sometimes if a person spends some time in two different countries because they'll go, well, the perspective of this country is like this. The perspective of this country is like this. They can see two points of view. And now that they realize there's two points of view, they can objectively choose one or the other versus a person who's only has one point of view they just accept the authority in their in their country, in their institution, and it makes them stupider because um, they're not able to perceive all the part, sides of the elephant, if you will, and see the big picture. Yeah, so that's one thing I too is I think that helps to energize a person. I'm looking at my little list to see what else. Oh, I made a list of every 30-minute segment throughout the entire day, and I would make sure I am not going to waste a minute. I never watch TV. I think TV is, you know, for idiots. It basically, because in order to make money, they have to gear it towards the less intelligent population and their advertising as well. It's very vulgar. I don't like it. So I haven't watched TV in like in 40 years. Internet, you can pick what you watch. Uh, let's see what else. Even then people say, well, they got a good show on the History Channel or something like that. And I'm like, BS, the history they're going to have on there is always going to be watered down and narrow. You, you want real history, read a book or go to a course. 
Um, you know, Wonder Room is a different, decent site. Now, don't get me wrong, I think a lot of their classes stink, but they also do have some really good stuff. And you can real quick, you know, get 10, 12 or more hours of lecture on a subject that can introduce you to the subject pretty quick. And it's cheap, like about 15, 10, 15 bucks a month. So I think that's a reasonable thing. I thought the 50 Rules of Power book by Green was pretty good. Oh, yeah. The, and, the Laws of Power one? That one? Yeah, yeah. 50 yeah. Laws of Power. And it's a little bit of a harsh book. It but is. unfortunately, the world's a little bit harsh, you know? Um, I had one time my kid came up to me and he's like, you know, dad, his teacher gave him a bad grade. It was unfair. And I'm like, yeah, I, I agree. She, I think you deserved a better grade. But I'm also going to tell you, you know, you kind of have to just adapt yourself to a system. What I meant by that is I said, in a sense, you're almost like a, a rabbit walking down a trail in the forest, you know? And sometimes there's going to be a hawk up in the tree. There's going to be a snake over there. There's going to be a coyote or a wolf over there. And you just have to, you know, have your spot ready to run in your, your little hole or have your, you know, your food or whatever, that the world just is the way it is. So you can't change the world. It's not going to change because you want it to change. It is what it is. What you need to do is try to understand it as best you can so you can navigate it effectively. Because I think a lot of people spend time being sad because they feel like they're screwed. They don't have a good opportunity or they just don't have the talents in the area that they want to do something. And I say to them you know, one time, I say, consider yourself lucky. You're only half screwed. Okay. A lot of people are totally screwed. Okay. You're only half screwed. Okay. And consider that a blessing and be grateful to that because a sense of gratitude that you at least you have some options, some opportunities, you're fortunate, you know? And like my father said, most people since the beginning of time, 95% of them, they're just peasants who are going to starve to death if they don't, you know, scratch some food out of the ground with their farming. And if there's bad weather that year, they will starve to death. So life is pretty tough. Um, so I think once you accept the fact that life is going to be tough, there was a sign in the wall of one of the senior wrestlers when I was out there, he was an all American guy, one of my heroes, it said, do not ask for an easier life because you are not going to get it. Pray to become a stronger person because that is achievable. And I think that's kind of been my philosophy too. The world's not going to change. I just have to keep on trying to improve as much as possible in these areas to adapt myself to it, you know, and that's, you know, my best hope. Another thing too, as far as like saving people. Alcoholics Anonymous, for example, the persons have to find a new substitute for that alcohol. And the people who were the most sub, most successful were the ones who switched to Christianity. It could be whatever. It could be some other religion. It could be whatever. But what I'm trying to say is they have to find a new substitute in their life for that big thing, alcohol. Because the alcoholic patients, they're kind of strange. They're like, oh, the feeling. I just love that feeling of alcohol. And I'm like, they need something else that makes them happy. Otherwise, they're just going to go back to drinking alcohol. Oh, another thing is, you could end up being really good even if you're not great at anything. And what, I'm, what am I saying? Imagine you wanted to write comic books, okay? You don't have to be the best artist if you're just a decent artist. You don't have to be the best writer if you're just a decent writer and you can combine being able to write, being able to make the comic books. Um, if you've got those skills and, and there's like one other skill, what I'm saying is you can have a variety of skills. And also if you've got promotion skills, sales skills, you can have a very successful career. So Figure out what's relevant to what you want to do and develop those skills uh, because those complementary skills can be synergistic and you can do great in a field. And that's kind of what I, oh, one thing getting back to Dave Schultz, the wrestler, he was the fat dyslexic kid who became world champion. We trained our first uh, workouts as a team at Stanford and um, we went to the weight room and we lifted weights and he was weak. I'm like, this guy's weak. And he was also fat and he had a big belly on him. And then we ran sprints. We had to run sprints up the hills, you know, the Palo Alto, the foothills out there. And he was slow. And I'm like, how did this guy get to be, you know, national champion? And he's fat, weak, and slow. And the reason was he was so great at technique. And technique's like an exponential thing. You can only get about 10%, you know, maybe 20% at most stronger than the other guys in your field. You can only get about 10% better endurance than them. But you could be 100 times better than them in technique. Like what Bruce Lee was in martial arts, that's what his technique was to wrestling. And in a sense, when somebody's technique is that good, they can anticipate what their opponent's going to do, even if they don't have the best physical quickness, because they sense the whole movement of the of their opponent, just like a tennis player knows where the serve's going to be, because they can sense it from the way the person lines up on the serve. That's what it is in wrestling. So it seemed like he was lightning fast, just because he kind of like read your mind. He knew what you're going to do as soon as you initiated the movement. So that's what I'm saying. I, I actually, I learned from him. I call this, this system of improvement, I call it incrementalism. First of all, you try to find some exponential skill. Most things are linear, analog. You can only improve in an analog sense. But if you find the magic thing in your field where you can improve exponentially, you can become dominant person in that field. In addition, 
what I did for school is I said, well, what can I do in school? I can learn to take better notes. I can learn how to get more out of class. I learned to always sit right in the front row. I'd always sit right in the front row. So there's nothing between me and the teacher in the lecture. Because otherwise, you get distracted. People are on their phones or their laptop or something. No, in the front row. I would always go to class on time and never miss a class. When I was younger, I'm like, screw this class. It sucks. I don't want to wake up and stay home. I'll just get the notes. But you miss things. And so I learned once I got more serious and I tried, I had a whole system. I wrote a book, uh, Top Medical Student Scores. I wrote another straight A at Stanford. I, I figured out all of these things about academics. You sit right in the front row. And I would look at biochemistry as a game, me and the teacher. It's like we're playing hockey. I'm the goalie. You're not getting anything past me. Come on, old man. All right. And so that getting psyched up, it helped because your brain only remembers what it thinks is important. And if you convince yourself and you're a little bit energized and you're emotionally committed, your brain remembers things that are emotionally important to you. Then you just perceive a lot more. Because I used to hate going into a biochemistry class and the teacher would overwhelm me. I'd only you know, recall about 10, 15% of it. I'd have to relearn it all when I was studying. So I started to pre-read the night before. I'd pre-read the night before, sometimes a couple of hours. Then I would know all the vocabulary, all the abbreviations. Then I'd go there, I'd sit in the front row. I'd say things to myself like, you know, this biochemistry, he's an old guy. His career is almost older. He's ready to be put out to pasture. He's only teaching biochem because he can't do research anymore. And I'm the future, not him. Because I was trying to get myself psyched up because I was so intimidated by these biochemistry professors. And once I started to think that way and get all excited, and I also told myself, this is the language of God. I got to learn the language of God if I'm ever going to be a good scientist or doctor. And I get right in the front row. Then I started to recall most of the lecture. It became like a review, most of it. I would be picking out maybe 80% to 90% almost. And my, I just started to crush everything in biochemistry. I would put four books out on my table and I'd look at them, look at the cycle. Let's say like house. I say, what is the irreducible minimum from which I can derive all the rest? What is it? And I would look at this. I'd look at the cycles. I'd look at the cycles. I'd read about it. And I'd say, what is the key here? What is the key here? What is the key here? And I would realize it's the phosphates. Okay. Once you memorize where the phosphates going in, in glycolysis, it's easy to remember glycolysis. And I did that for every cycle. And then I would write a mnemonic, okay? Or, and that is a, a form of rehearsal. And I would just walk around and I'd say it all back to myself. Close the book. Most students, they just look at their highlighted notes and then they go take a test versus I call this a self-test. Close the book and I walk around and I talk to myself. I have to articulate every single thing. You put a copy of it then in your speech center, in your hearing center, and you're seeing it in your mind's eye. And once I started doing that, I, I, just, I started to crush everything in biochemistry. But that was, that was the transition there. It wasn't just looking at my highlighted notes. I could articulate every single step of the cycle, everything relevant to it. Um, and so anyways, those are some of the tricks. I had a system of taking notes. I had, a, I had always had a form of condensed notes, meaning that everything was in one spot. So when it was time to study for finals, I didn't have to search around through a bunch of books or a syllabus. It was all in one spot. I always made sure right from the beginning, everything was going to be in one spot to the extent that's possible, because then you could find it all quickly. Um, later on, I learned about flashcards, which can be very useful through Anki or through making your own, through Lightner boxes in the bathroom and stuff. Um, and those study techniques helped. Thank you. This is all in incredibly useful. It's just a gold mine of info. Yeah, because I actually think having good study skills plus a good psychology, I call it your metaphysics. I say you've got to get your metaphysics right. Because if your metaphysics, your, your, your personal value system, your philosophy of what's important is correct, everything else will follow. For example, I'll mention a book. There's a book called The Sorrows of Young Werther, Okay. Um, and it was written by Goethe, the German, around what, around uh, 1800 or something. And the story was there's a young guy, and, and I think his name might have been Wilhelm or something, or Goethe. Goethe was his name. Wilhelm was his friend. And they didn't have cell phones in that day. So he kept writing letters to his friend Wilhelm about this girl he was in love with, Charlotte. And he's like, oh, the way she walks, the way she talks, the way she interacts with her siblings, the way she dresses. I'm so in love. Everything about her is perfect. And he's nonstop just obsessing about Charlotte. And what I'm saying is, if he loved biology as much as he loved Charlotte, he'd be the best biology student in the United States. So try to fall in love with whatever you're doing. At least tell yourself, I might do this for a career. And the reason I say that is, if you do that, you're sending a signal to your brain, this is important. You want to really learn it, not just memorize it for the test, hope you get a good grade, but actually really learn it. Let it become part of you. Be able to articulate all the nuance of the field. Because I'll give you one more example along those lines. Let's say you take Spanish. What does everybody do in Spanish? They say to themselves, this class is kind of stupid pain in the butt. I got to memorize all these grammar questions. They figure out how to do the grammar questions, take a test and do okay. But then, you know, a couple of weeks later, they don't know anything. And what I'm saying is when you take that grammar class, don't say, I just want to try to get a good grade. Say to yourself, I want to try to really learn Spanish. I want to be able to enjoy Spanish culture, Spanish literature, be able to talk to people. And you start approaching it that way. You try to have conversations with someone or you go on the internet, you listen to audio books, um, you listen to music. You know, I, I wrote a whole book. I don't even know. I still got it around. Uh, my lyrics, where the heck is it? 
a book on how to learn Spanish? Yeah, yeah. For example, here's my, my book of Spanish. And all these are tab indices. I took all the Spanish songs and I transcribed all their lyrics into English. And, you know, some of them, I just got them off the internet, of course. Um, and then I had a Spanish lady friend and she helped me too. So I would listen to all these things. I, I actually made this whole giant collection of Spanish music and I, I knew all the words in English. So what I got from this was, you don't get as much vocabulary as you do from reading, but I got the emotional nuance of all of it. Um, and that's a whole long story how this, why this was so important to me. But um, and then here's a table of contents in the front of it. So what I'm saying is Ivy always making some type of book like that. You know, all the songs are in there. And that was a lot of fun to study Spanish. And then the other thing I did is I worked up from all those books like um, self-help books, like a Brian Tracy book, for example, to then Da Vinci Code. Da Vinci Code is 16 audio CDs with the big book. And once I knew everything in Da Vinci Code, my Spanish was pretty good. But you see what I'm saying is it, was, it wasn't just taking a class doing a grammar question. So the, the student who approaches it that way, trying to really learn the language, they might get a B or a C on their midterm. But you know what? By the time they get to finals, they're going to be the best student in the class because they really have a feeling for language. They use the language. They can understand the nuance. They can anticipate and predict and, and work with the language. And in the long run, they'll have the language. So that's the better way to go. Even though it's more difficult in the beginning, choosing the right thing. I really want to learn Spanish. And then going about it from the communication approach, your reading approach, in the long run, you'll be much more successful. You'll become a true, real, advanced student of that or, or scholar or expert versus, in a sense, just trying to get a grade is like faking it. You know what I mean? You will you might get your grade, good for you, but you really haven't learned anything that's going to stay with you long term. Absolutely. You're talking about the importance of having the love for what you learn. And I'm curious, what are you currently in love with learning? Well, I think that I was a little bit sad at first in my medical career because I'm like, you know, here I am. I'm like the best student in the class, but I can't do a damn thing other than just sort of generate billing codes, go through the motions. When I was in surgery, it was actually more straightforward and radiology in the sense that there was a clear cut operation. This is what we have to do. The patient has an abscess in the pelvis. We have to approach transgluteal here, put in a 10 French catheter, drain the abscess, success or unsuccess. Okay. It was, it was pretty straightforward. Uh, and with radiology, like reading a brain MRI, that's also pretty straightforward in a sense. Does the patient have a stroke? Yes or no. But what I also saw was people would be coming to ask me advice. Like I felt terrible that my, my, my old girlfriend's mother had a terrible death and I wasn't able to do anything to help. I felt terrible that my mom died of cancer. She did live 12 years. They only thought she was going to get two. But then I learned about Ruth Heidrich. She's alive 45 years later running triathlons. And I'm like, why didn't I know this? I could have maybe saved my mother's life and got her another, you know, 20 years or something. And, you know, my father, he kind of got pushed in to get an open heart surgery and he did okay. But I'm like, if I'd have really known what I know now, that was many, like 20 something years ago. If I had known then what I know now about atherosclerosis, I would have said, no, dad, you're going hundred percent vegan. I'm going to insist on it. I'll take a couple months off from work. I'm going to get you right. So what I'm saying is I was kind of pissed off because I'd given up my whole life to become a doctor, really my whole social, everything else. And here I am. I don't know how to help anybody other than I know how to do my surgeries. I knew how to read a film, but I should know whatever there is to know. And the fact that I did, and the fact it's not in the books, that pissed me off because I sort of felt like I give up my whole life to learn this. And now you're going to tell me that I can't even help people. Uh, so then I find all the answers are in this book, like the Holy Grail of Health. It's sitting right here. All these researchers have figured it all out. It's just that nobody's put it all together in one spot. I mean, don't get me wrong. McDougal's done a tremendous job with all his newsletters and his book, Start Solution and whatnot. And there's some other great books out there in nutrition. And there's some other great places and websites. I realize there's a few scattered, isolated things, but it is not, I guarantee you, it is not part of the mainstream consciousness about health and medicine. You know, in my personal life, I only know one doctor who knows a little bit about this stuff. In all the books, it's not in any of the books. So I feel like this is the area where you have the most chance to really help people. If you help a person straight out their, straighten out their understanding of nutrition and toxicology and lifestyle and stuff, you can give 30 extra healthy years of their life, 40 extra healthy years of their life. You know, a lot of the stuff I was doing in surgery, you know, we might keep the guy alive for an extra couple months and that's nice, but you know, it's nice to help a person get a couple extra decades. Absolutely. I'm assuming you're an eternal student, always learning things, always looking for self-improvement. Are there areas of your life right now, which you're looking to improve upon? Are there any vices you struggle with? I just don't have that much time. You know, I'm 59 years old. You know, I have to work. I'm a full-time physician. That takes a lot of my time. So I basically enjoyed making the YouTube. I enjoyed writing the books, but hardly anybody reads. Plus, I think my books are great, but especially my most recent ones, but I don't have any marketing. You know what I mean? 
and I don't have the time to do it. So I realize a lot more people for every person who reads a book, there's like a thousand that'll watch a video. So I started making these videos and, and I like it. I mean, so that's why I do it because I think that's, I sort of feel like I'm giving a gift to mankind. They're all free. It's all there. And so the people that are curious enough, smart enough to find it, it's there and hopefully they're helped by it. And I also, I wanted to correct it. It kind of upset me that so many of these, these, these nutrition experts and doctors are, are basically lying to the public. Okay. Telling people to eat paleo, keto. Those are complete nonsense, complete nonsense. You know, it might, you know, if you avoid processed food, that might be one step positive. But other than that, it, it's really not funny. I mean, it's not funny to lie to the public because, you know, they really suffer. They die. I mean, I see them. I see awful things happen to people all the time. Major, major surgeries, complications, amputations, strokes. It's, it's, it's sad. And I can also tell you too, you don't necessarily get a second chance. I'll just give you like what I consider a typical case. Guy has a heart attack, myocardial infarction. The myocardial infarction, it means dead heart muscles and infarction. So now his conduction, his conduction patterns of electricity through the heart are not normal. And he has to get a pacemaker. So they put a pacemaker in, pacemaker gets infected. The infection of the pacemaker spreads to the blood. The blood infection spreads to his spine. The spine infection spreads to his spinal cord. He's paraplegic, okay? And so if he had not had the original heart attack, he would have never become paraplegic. And the only thing that'll prevent this guy from having a heart attack is if he knew how to eat, how to feed himself. And, you know, so it's sort of like, you, you don't want to wait until after you've had a heart attack to get your act together because you might not get a second chance. All these events happen to this guy in less than one year. And, you know, and now his life's kind of severely uh, disabled because of that. And yeah. I see things like that, some variation of that every day. And so wow. people say to me, well, how could you be so motivated? How could you really stick with your diet? I'm like, you know why? Because I'm glad to be healthy. All my arms and legs move. My brain is still sharp. Plus the other thing too, I look at a lot of these writers and I, I read a lot of books and I would see writers who were really good in their fifties. And then in their sixties, they lose a step. And in their seventies, they kind of stink. They, they're, they're no longer sharp. They're no longer, you know, surprising me or making me laugh. And I'm like, these guys are cognitively impaired compared to how they were before. And I'm like, well, I don't want to end up like that. And so I spent a tremendous amount of time studying cognitive decline. All right. And I look at tons of brains and I say, well, why is this person demented? And I've talked about that before, but basically all this atherosclerosis, all this diabetes stuff, hypertension related stuff, it all damages the brain and all these processed foods. So it, it happens so slowly, you know, boiling the frog or whatever you want to call it, that people don't know it, but you know, you'll end up Tons and tons of people are, are cognitively slow by their mid fifties and afterwards. I have an internal medicine doctor friend and she told me, she said just about all of her patients over 60 are cognitively impaired. They're mentally slow. They, you know, they're pleasant. They got decent social skills, but they're just, you know, typical diabetic. I say, you know, they just got their foot amputated. I'm like, you might want to try to improve their diet. And they're like, Oh doc, are you going to take away my ice cream? Well, my ice cream is one of my few joys in life. They're just like oblivious while they're, while they're, they're sort of spiraling down um, and it's kind of sad at my age, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? And I'm like, try to save yourself. How about that? Agreed a hundred percent. Wow. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Rogers. It's been a blast as usual. I just so appreciate how you don't water things down. Like you said, you just give us all the info in the videos, all the truths you have. And that's why we trust you so much. Thank you again for everything. And for today, teaching us things like how to motivate ourselves, how to become smarter, why to protect our health for life and how to think critically and fight against these systems, which try to make us into sheep. <laughs> it's all very, very appreciated. Yeah, well, thank you.